tried to lift my hand. I could not feel my hand. I tried to move my legs, but it's like half of my body was not, was numb, basically. I, my entire left side of my body, I tried touching my face, I could not feel my face. I tried pinching myself with my right hand. And it's like my face was not even there. It's like I'm, I'm touching on air, I'm touching on nothing. I tried to feel my hand. I could see it, but I could not feel it. And suddenly I started feeling cold. And my body began dying. I I cannot explain to you the kind of shock I was in at that point, but it hit me that I you were getting a stroke. I screamed on top of my lungs. Immediately I had my mom come into my room, my kids came into my room wondering what was happening, and I told them I cannot feel the left, the left side of my body. I tried touching me, what are you saying? I cannot feel it. I said, yes, I can't. I cannot feel my arm, I cannot feel my leg. My face, I felt like my face was falling. I felt like my stomach was falling. And I was telling them, I'm falling, my heart is falling. It's like, it's, that's the only sensation I could have on my body. It's like, it was falling, my lips, I felt like, I, I tried doing this to my face. I'm like, my face is falling, my, my lips is falling, my, my ears, I feel like they're being pulled down. It's like something is pulling me down. Like my face is being pulled down, my hand is being pulled down. And the headache was still on a hundred. Like a hundred. It was about to break the bar. It was at the end of the bar. That was it. It was at the end of the bar. And they, my mom called somebody who came to pick me up and I cannot remember. Was it an ambulance? This is what happens. During that time, I started losing memory. I started losing, like how I told you earlier that I would lose memory of words and I was unable to identify which words to use to make a, in order to make a statement. Even today, I try to remember some of the things that were happening during that time. When I cannot fully remember. Like, I can't remember if I was taken to hospital by a taxi or somebody came to get me. I am not sure. But I remember getting to the hospital. When we go to the hospital, now by this time, um, she was using a lot of money. I didn't have medical insurance. They were paying cash. And by this time, I'm, I'm almost out of money. And I'm taken into Aga Khan. I'm immediately admitted. They check me. Uh, but still, after so many tests, they find nothing. Absolutely nothing. Here they, they repeated the CT scan and they also did uh, an MRI scan. But the MRI scan came out, you know, positive. Everything was, was functioning okay. They put me on some painkillers, but still. So they had to inject me with these things. But even after injecting me, remember I told you earlier that the pain was like 100? At this time, I felt like okay. We are at 80 now. I'm able to sit up. I'm able to drink something. After two days, they discharged me. So I went home with these painkillers. And, you know, they, they decided, the doctors just decided because they cannot find anything on my head, they cannot find anything on my, <clears throat> on my heart. Because I had also had some heart um, examinations. They didn't find anything. They checked uh, meningitis, they didn't find anything, they did some blood work, they didn't find anything. And so they said, you know, you need to see, go for counseling when you were stressed. But I knew, I was sure that I was not being stressed. So they, they had to discharge me because there was no reason to put me in the hospital. So I went back home. After going home, still, I was feeling so much pain. And everyone kept calling and texting, asking, what is the doctor saying? How are you feeling today? And 
was like, you know what, I am still sick, I'm still in so much pain, I don't know what's going on, uh, I'm losing memory, like literally losing memory, I'm unable to construct a statement, I'm forgetting people, I'm, I'm forgetting even myself, I'm forgetting what is happening to me, like, <laughs> when I remember this thing, I, <clears throat> I, I get emotional, remembering that I was, I was forgetting, I was forgetting who I am. I was, I was lacking the sense of, you know, self. You know that sense you have, but you know yourself. You know who you are. You know where you stay. You know your family. You know where you work. All that was was dying. It was dying. I was not. I was starting to lose awareness of all this, and it was not easy to tell anybody that this is what was happening to me. One day it got very worse. It got too bad and I called my sister. My, I think I called my sister. She came and took me back to the hospital. We went back these few days after being admitted. She we went back to the hospital. At this time, I'm so sick I cannot even speak. And you go to see the nurse, you can see the doctor, you see there are those um, questions the nurse gets to ask you when she's checking your weight, she's trying to talk to you again. It was so hard for me to talk, I could just look at her, you know, because I was in so much pain. And the only thing that I could do was cry. Tears were just flowing, you know, really flowing from my eyes because of the headache. If you've ever had a migraine, you will understand. <clears throat> You'll understand what what I was going through and the kind of pain that I was I was feeling. When we went to see the doctor, he was surprised to see me that I'm back after two days. He asked, "Can we give you some very strong medication? What is going on?" And I told him that the medication was not working, and I think that's the only thing I said to him. Anything else he asked, I, I couldn't. So my sister would speak on my behalf. And because she did not live with me, she had to call the people who lived with me to ask exactly uh, the, the same questions the doctor was asking me because I was not responding. At this time, the doctor decided, you know, we can't let him go. This is now a serious case. At this time, <laughs> I don't have any money and I'm being admitted again. For you to be admitted, you really you know, at, at the current hospital, you have to have a good chance, a little bit, a little bit less than a hundred k. I didn't have any money at that time, so. But somebody came in through for me, uh, came to put in a deposit, and I was able to, you know, get admission. At this time, this night, where when I was admitted and out with my sister, the doctor asked me to get an MRV. This is a scan where they check your vein, the blood vein, the, your brain, they check the vein and the arteries, so that's what they did. They checked my veins on the scar on the brain, they checked veins, they checked arteries, they checked all this. Uh, this, this, like that was the worst day of all. It was the worst day of all. I had never, even when I was getting the minor stroke, I, I had never been in this much pain like the one I was in on this day. After, after the test, the doctor came back with a report and I want to read what the report said. So on 12 May of 2015, remember this began early 2015, then now we're in May. And the findings were that a six millimeters focus of blooming on the GRE sequence, which shows enhancement of the post contrast image, is seen in the lower points on the right. So basically, uh, there is a filling defect with non opacification of the superior sagittal sinus anteriorly. I don't know what I'm saying. Suggestive of thrombosis. Yeah. So that is what that says. And then 
The conclusion was the six millimeter Fontaine lesion described above is likely a brain stem carvedoma. There are features suggestive of a superior sagittal sinus thrombosis. Incidental finding of adenoid and tonsillar hypertrophy for which clinical correlation is recommended. So the doctor's explanation of this was I had a blood clot in one of my arteries in my brain. And he said that the six millimeter clot was located where memory is located. And so everything I have learned since birth, since my childhood, every experience I have gone through or I had gone through was located where the clot had formed. So he said that there is absolutely no way we are going to perform an operation because the surgery would touch on where my memory is stored and touching that would mean that after removal of the clot then I would have to learn everything over again. I would have to learn how to eat, I would have to learn how to move. Basically I would become a toddler again and that is not something they would want to 